Welcome to Bruce Hurwitz Presents Meet the Experts. I'm your host, Bruce Hurwitz of Hurwitz Strategic Staffing. You can find us on the web at hsstaffing.com. I hope you consider us for all your staffing, career counseling, and professional writing needs. Momentarily, I will be joined by Jim Marshall to discuss the scale of personal influence. Meet the Experts is sponsored by PNK CPAs. PNK is a full service accounting firm. They provide accounting and consulting services to businesses ranging from startups to small and mid cap companies to nonprofits as well as high net worth individuals. Contact them today for a free consultation at info at pk cpas.com or call them at 973-882-8810. They will be happy to be of service. Jim, welcome back. Thanks, Bruce. Good to see you. We're here previously on November 1st, and I was intrigued, so I invited you to come back, but let's begin the way we always do. Take a moment or two and introduce yourself to our viewers. Well, I am the discoverer of hitherto unknown natural phenomena, which greatly aid in the understanding of people, from which I constructed the revolutionary practical philosophic system called Septemics, and published it in the book, Septemics, Hierarchies of Human Phenomena. And we are going to be looking at and I want to share it now with our viewers. What you call the scale of personal influence. And let right. me just magically appear. What exactly are we looking at right now? Okay. Well, first of all, I should say that Septemics comprises a collection of scales or sequences, each of which breaks down various human phenomena into seven levels. This is one of those 35 scales. And I'm gonna tell you in detail exactly what it means and how it's beneficial to you. Okay. We'll start by explaining linear quantum in general. Okay. Every of each of these 35 scales is either a linear scale or a spiral scale. Now a linear scale is exactly what you would expect. It just goes in a line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A spiral scale, which this is not, has an apparent congruence between levels one and seven. So it's like a spiral where it goes up and down spiraling where one and seven overlap. That does not apply here. This is a quantum scale. Every scale is either quantum or gradual. Now, in a gradual scale, there is an infinitude of gradations between each of the levels. In a quantum scale, there is nothing between the levels. So you are either at level two or level three. There is nothing in between. So it's a quantum. And it's a general scale, meaning, except for very rare circumstances, you find a person's level on the scale and you're done with that person. Now you can, if you wish, help the person, even if it's yourself, move up to the next higher level, but this is not context driven. Many of the scales are specific scales, meaning they only make sense in a context. Uh, for example, the scale of motivation, what is my motivation toward my wife? What is my motivation toward my mother? What is my motivation toward my son? There are different contexts. But here, that is not the case. So a person has a characteristic way that he influences people. And of course, people move on the scale up and down. Now, under the word cause, you yes. don't have a, uh, a number of ones. It's more of a um, continuum from cause to effect, correct? Yes. So yes. That, that, that is mean, the axis. Okay. So does that mean that will is the cause and martyrdom or humility is the effect? No, not exactly. Let me explain it. Every, each one of these scales has an axis. In other words, each one of them is measuring a different thing. So I discovered these scales empirically, but in order for them to be useful to the person, it's not enough to just have the scale itself. You have to know 
What is this the scale of? What are we measuring with the scale? So what we are measuring with the scale is the gradation from cause to effect. So above level one is what you might call absolute cause. Below level seven is what you might call absolute effect. So you're going, as you go up, you're going from being effect to being cause. And as you go down, you're going from cause to being effect. And what are the plus and I assume minus signs under direction? Okay. Seven of the scales have this characteristic built into them. Now, the plus and minus do not mean good or bad, uh, and they don't mean add or subtract. They mean inflow, outflow. Uh, now, if it's inflow, I have it as a minus. And if it's outflow, I have it as a plus. Now, since this is about human phenomena, it makes more sense to explain it in terms of reach or withdraw. So when a person is outflowing, he's reaching. Like when you reach for an ice cream cone, right? You're not withdrawing, you're reaching. It's an outflow. Uh, or if a person uh, steps back, because he's afraid of a dog withdrawing from it. So that's like an inflow. So this scale has built into it an alternation between outflow and inflow. So it goes outflow, inflow, outflow, inflow, outflow, inflow, outflow. Uh, now, this is helpful to you because it helps you to spot the level. Because very often you can say, oh, this guy is really outflowing. You can see that a person is outflowing as opposed to inflowing. So if you have a wallflower, he goes to a dance, he sits on the side, uh, he doesn't talk to any girls, he doesn't dance, he's withdrawn. That person uh, is sort of inflowing. In other words, he's withdrawn. As opposed to another guy who's outflowing, he talks to all the girls, hello, how are you, let's dance. You see, he's reaching. So that's, that's a very different characteristic. Okay, so and, why is leadership inflowing and not outflowing? Because if you have charisma, you're not a wallflower. Well, let me put it this way. If you have charisma, you don't need to outflow. People flow to you. Like when Jack Kennedy would show up, thousands of people would be there and would cheer and would love him. And he would, had this, he exuded this natural leadership that people loved. And you can see it if you just look at him. He did not have to reach. You see, same thing with Elvis. He had a natural charisma. People reached him. He did not have to reach them. If you don't have charisma, then you have to reach people because you don't have that working for you. Now, if I, I don't remember if uh, President Kennedy, from the biographies I've read, because I'm too young to actually remember him, um, was shy, was a wallflower. But you have somebody, for example, like Johnny Carson, well known that he was a wallflower. He was very shy. Yes. He was not comfortable introducing himself to strangers. But right. he obviously had the charisma and everybody would go to him. So charisma has nothing to do with being an introvert or an extrovert. It's how other people relate to you. That's a question. First of all, first of all, I reject the premise of your statement about Johnny Carson. I, do, I dispute that Johnny Carson had charisma as it is defined on this scale. I would place Johnny Carson at level four, which is aloofness. He was an aloof person. Okay. He did a good, he did a very good job at interviewing people and he could be very funny, but he was fundamentally an aloof person. Similarly, Ronald Reagan was like that too. Okay. So I would have to explain each of these levels okay. so you could really see how to use it on people. Why don't we do that? Okay. So let me just be cognizant of the fact that we only have 20 minutes and you've got seven levels to go through. Right, <laughs> right. All right, so at the bottom is martyrdom. Now, martyrdom, you're being killed. You're, you are influencing people by your death. Well, that is 
at, as at effect as you can be. They're killing you, right? But that is an outflow. You are reaching out to people through your martyrdom. This is what Jesus did, okay? It is a state of humility. So the person influences people by his humility and his martyrdom reaches out to them. But this is a, a very low level in terms of cause and effect. He's not a cause over much of anything. They're killing him. Up from that is, is a little more uh, toward cause, but still a lot of effect, which is victimization. This is what we call a guilt trip. You know, like the mother says, uh -huh. oh, you should have been a doctor, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I feel you're wasting your life being an actor, you know. She's making a victim of herself. That is an inflow. She's like inflowing some kind of uh, energy as a victim. You Which see? has been around ever since there have been mothers. That's right. Up from that level five is domination. So this is what you see. This is how Hitler influenced people. He clearly influenced people. I mean, uh, he was the head of state and had millions of people on, who loved him, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, most Nazis thought he was the greatest man in the world. He influenced people by overwhelm. So if you well, they also speeches, thought he was six foot tall, blonde hair, and blue eyes. Well, I don't know who thought that. Well, they did. Okay. Germans did. Remember, this okay. was a time when uh, you didn't have uh, cable television. Right. But you did have films. You had film, film and you had pictures. Yeah. But right. at the very beginning, I should make it clear. Um, Germans thought Hitler was the ideal Aryan. Okay. Well, be that as it may, if you just watch his speeches, which you can find on the internet, sure. he was dominating people. You know, the so, way he spoke, he was overwhelming. And it's obvious that is a big outflow. He was outflowing energy at them. Now, above that is aloofness. Aloofness is restraint. Now, this is practiced more by women than by men, but not by a tremendous proportion. So as I said, Ronald Reagan was a somewhat restrained person. People who knew him personally all said he had this aloofness about him. Uh, so, you know, he was amiable and he was jocular. He was witty. Uh, he spoke very well, but he was sort of on an inflow. In other words, he was kind of withdrawn in an emotional way. He was aloof. Now up from that is reason. This is influencing people by reason. This is what lawyers do. This is what politicians do when they're on the stump. They are using logic. They are reaching out with logic. So the lawyer goes into the courtroom and he's reaching out to the judge and the jury with his logic. And he, he makes his argument, which has some kind of logic to it, uh, and he puts the facts in a certain light, and he's using reason. So this is what you get from people like Cicero, who was the greatest statesman of Rome. Up from that, you get charisma, which we discussed a little bit, and you get people who have this natural leadership quality that just draws people into them. It's like a vacuum cleaner. It's like almost irresistible. Uh, People like Elvis, as I said, and JFK are obvious examples of people who were tremendously charismatic and would draw people into them with this kind of emotional vacuum cleaner that they have. And then at the top is telepathy, which is will. We will influence people by telepathy. Now, a, an easy way to explain this is the famous original Star Wars movie okay. from, I think it was 1970. stop the share so viewers can yes. Go ahead. You just okay. Star Wars. Okay, so I was saying in the original Star Wars movie, uh, which was a massive phenomenon at the time, bigger than most people know today. So there's a scene where Obi-Wan Kenobi is in the speeder with Luke and the two droids. And the Empire is already looking for these droids. And they have to go into the city. So when they get to the city, Obi-Wan Kenobi says, Soto Voce, these are not the droids we're looking for. And the sergeant of the guard turns to his comrades and says, these are not the droids we're looking for. 
he implanted that idea into the head of the guard. Now, obviously throughout these, the, the Jedi had special abilities, psychic abilities of various kinds. So that is sort of like a fictional uh, example of what I'm talking about. If you can influence people by will, you can just make them do something. Now, there are people who have this power, like a guy can just, just uh, like, like a woman can decide, this guy is going to come over to me and ask me for a date. And he does. She did it by telepathy. She didn't say anything. She didn't do anything. Okay. Now, I'm not talking about luck. I'm talking about actually doing it, where you make something happen. Uh, a salesman can do this. He can, he can implant into the client, you are going to buy this car, and the guy buys the car. I have done this at times and have people just wonder, why did I do that? You know, what, what, what happened there? You know, that's what happens with telepathy. You just, it's, uh, it's will that you put on to somebody by telepathic means. So those are the seven ways. Now, if you come up with other ways, there are subsets of these. Now, what's the takeaway? I know why I wanted to discuss personal influence. Why do you see this as important? How can someone use this for good or evil to okay. achieve a goal? Okay. Well, we had an example already where you identified Johnny Carson as being level two, and I said, no, he's not. He's at level four. Uh, and so you had a misperception of him. Now, remember, there's aloofness is an inflow just as charisma is an inflow. So it's easy to make that mistake because they're both a type of withdrawing, and they're withdrawn somewhat. So uh, you can assess a person and say, what is going on with this guy? What is he doing? So, for example, it's a big thing in our society now to be victimized. It's, it's, a, it's a thousand times bigger than it was 50 years ago. Oh, I'm black or I'm a woman or I'm Latino uh, or I'm trans or something. And so I'm oppressed. And so you run this guilt trip on everybody. You should be nice to me because I'm a victim. So you can sort of spot that. Say, oh, this guy's influencing me by victimization. And you can see what's going on. And when you do, then you can say, well, let's put that aside and actually look at the merits of what he's actually saying. What does this guy actually have to offer? In other words, uh, do I want to hire him just because I feel sorry for him because he's black? That's not a good reason to hire somebody. You want to hire him because he's smart and he knows what he's doing and he wants the job. So you can use this in all kinds of ways. Now, women are very good at being aloof. They draw men into them. So you have the cliche of the woman. She goes by and she drops the handkerchief and the guy rushes in and picks it up and gives it to her, right? So Victorian women, for example, were extremely aloof. If you just watch them, they were very aloof. And so they were covered up to their necks and everything and down to their feet with very aloof. Uh, they were not at all like the women of today. Now there are still women today, especially very beautiful women who are very aloof because you have beautiful women. I knew somebody like this. She was so beautiful, it was almost painful to look at her. And so she probably had guys coming after her all the time. So she had this aloofness where she was withdrawn, you know, so you really had to go out of your way to get her to even look at you because she did not want to deal with all of this. So just understanding what's going, going on there tells you what, what the dynamic is. So uh, people, if people had spotted Hitler as influencing people by domination, many of them would have said, I don't think I want to vote for a guy who influences us by domination. I want to vote for a guy who influences us by reason, which is the way most uh, politicians uh, in the United States are. 
now, you know, to explain, this is my policy, this is why we should lower the taxes, blah, 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 they're using reason. Uh, so just, they would not have been drawn into it if they spotted it. So in a sense, this sort of indemnifies you against the effect because you see what it is. When you see what it is, then you can look at it and you can decide how you want to deal with this person. I'm thinking of the reputation of Mother Teresa. Uh-huh. And the influence she had. Mm -hmm. And then I was watching a program on leadership. And uh -huh. they always say Hitler on one side, Mother Teresa on the other end. And that's just standard operating procedure. And the gentleman in the audience raised his hand. And he asked the speaker, how many individuals did Mother Teresa bring out of poverty? And the man looked at him and said, I don't know. And the questioner said, none. Everyone she worked with remained in their same socioeconomic level. She may have gotten them minimal health care. Mm -hmm. so they survived, but they, mm -hmm. she never got anybody quality of life. Right. And that sort of took her off of her pedestal, at least for that uh, right. uh, presentation. Now, when I've written about leadership, I use, um, I forget his first name, Drucker. Stephen Drucker? Not sure. Doesn't matter. Uh, his definition of leader, of, of being a leader, is someone who has followers. If you mm -hmm. don't have followers, you're not a leader. You can mm -hmm. have all the attributes, but if no one's following you, you're not leading. So I looked at followers and I came up with two types. Followers by coercion. You have to do what I tell you to do or you're going to be fired or you're going to be thrown in jail or I'm going to put you up against a wall and shoot you. Mm -hmm. And then there are followers by conviction meaning you want to follow this person. You agree with them, you believe in them, and you want to be a part of what they are trying to accomplish. How does that fit in with your scale of personal influence? Okay, when you say that, you just gave me about a 500 word paragraph. So <laughs> what exactly do you mean by that? How does the difference between followers fit in with personal influence. Well, now, I'm not I mean, you can say that uh, domination is followers by uh, coercion and um, reason is followers by conviction. Right. It's as simple well, as that. Well, I think if you, to the extent that you have personal influence, you tend to get followers. I mean, Jesus influenced people by martyrdom, and 2,000 years later, a billion people are still following him. So he obviously had a big effect, even though it was at the bottom of the scale. And by the way, since you talked about Hitler and Mother Teresa, Hitler, in the first six years of his reign, lifted a lot of people out of poverty which is why he was Times Man of the Year several times. Prior to invading Poland, he was highly regarded, unless you were Jewish. And a lot of those people just got out of there, like Einstein, for example, and, and uh, Henry Kissinger's family. They just got out of there, which was smart, because they saw the writing on the wall. But Hitler uh, actually did lift a lot of people out of poverty because because the Germany was a wreck when he was elected in 33. And he was highly praised for what he did with the German economy. So, yeah, you know, he, it's it all, tapas, he, he turned but, it into a military state. I mean, yeah, yes, he raised the country. Maybe he made the country a world power, which then resulted in it being destroyed and worse shape than when he took over yeah well the man was a was a psychopath 
mm. and, and and a racist, and he was he was at the bottom of the scale of personal of uh, basic purposes, which is another scale. Uh, he's inherently destructive, but it's important to point out that there are thirty five scales, and you can't parse everything with one scale. So if you actually read the book, you'll see. Oh, now I understand what's going on with Joe. He's explained by this scale. And Fred is explained by this scale. So you can see the phenomena jumping out at you in different contexts as you look at the 35 scales. There's, this is a narrow context. It's only personal influence, which is one narrow thing. So you could have a brilliant, wonderful person who does not influence people very much personally. So for example, uh, Schopenhauer, the brilliant uh, German uh, philosopher, he was, he was not well known in his time. His, his writings became famous after his death. So he wasn't really influencing a lot of people. After his death, his materials proliferated and then he had an influence, but of course he was already dead. So you can't say it was a personal influence. But so, it's the same thing with artists. After they die, their paintings are, uh, are worth a fortune. When they're living, they live in poverty. Well, some of them live in poverty mm -hmm. and some of them, their paintings are worth a fortune. I mean, that's a cliche, yeah. but I mean, there are, there are obviously exceptions. Yeah, there are exceptions. Yeah. Yeah. What I want to do now though, because we're running out of time, is to once again share a screen with your contact information. And before we started, you said you wanted to add something here, explain something about your website. Okay, well, I just want to invite your viewers to my website where you can see what many readers have said about this, what many journalists have written about this, what the reviews are. You can read sections of the book itself, and there's a pre recorded. Introduction to Septemics, which explains the subject to a new person. Well, Jim, I want to thank you for coming back. I appreciate it. You're the only the second guest I've had. No, that's not true. Um, you're one of the few guests I've had who I've invited back. And I'm glad you accepted the invitation. Well, thank you, Bruce. It's a pleasure to speak to you. I'm Bruce Hurwitz. Thank you for watching. And as always, please. Stay focused on success.